Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to today's webinar, The Pivot, Living and Working During COVID-19. We're going to be talking about economic realities of uh, living through this unprecedented pandemic. And as always, I welcome John Carroll, our moderator for today. John is a strategist, a growth consultant, he is president of Unlimited Performance. John helps uh, companies, executives, teams, organizations uh, grow more productively, be more profitable, and have more fun. So as always, it's wonderful to have you, Mr. Carroll. Thank you so much for moderating the pivot, being a, really the creator of the pivot, and serving on the Mount Pleasant Chamber on our executive board, being such a valuable member. Hope you're doing well, sir. Thank you, Rebecca. I am doing well, and I'm grateful for uh, your help and guidance um, and support through all of this. Um, I add my welcome to everyone to The Pivot, a weekly series of informational discussions on our local, regional, and national issues in the midst of and following the current pandemic. This event is presented exclusively by the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. My role as moderator is to introduce our guests get the discussion started with some questions and give those attending the event live the opportunity to participate by using the chat or Q&A function, which Rebecca will be monitoring. Thank you for taking the time with your Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce to join fellow members in staying informed and helping you take care of your team, your clients and your customers, as well as take care of business in post pandemic conditions. If effective social and community outreach was critical before the pandemic and resulting lockdowns, it is now essential to more community members than ever. Our guests today are in the thick of that outreach. Let's meet them and learn more of their journeys from concept uh, all the way through implementation and results and outcomes. Our first guest today on the pivot is Kathy Easley. Kathy has lived in Somerville and volunteered in the community for 40 years and has worked for 29 of those for Trident United Way. She serves currently as Director of Integrated Community Systems, which oversees partner agencies and direct service programs, including Charity Tracker, 211, the Berkeley and Dorchester Resource Connection Centers, the AmeriCorps program, and the partnership with SC Thrive. Kathy works with all of the agencies, churches, and faith-based organizations in Berkeley, Charleston, and Dorchester counties to collaborate and collectively move individuals from crisis to stability to self-sustainability. Kathy, welcome to The Pivot. Thank you so much, George. Glad to have you. Our second guest joining us for this discussion is George Roberts. George leads East Cooper Meals on Wheels as its president and CEO. After 20 years in corporate work, George began working with nonprofits, first as executive director of a teaching arts center in Atlanta, then relocating to Charleston to work with Blackbaud, and now for eight years with East Cooper Meals on Wheels. He uses his experience to help build the best organization possible to ensure no homebound residents in our area go hungry. George says he comes to work each day with a big smile, knowing that his staff and volunteers share this passion. George, welcome to The Pivot. Thank you, John. Glad to have you both. Kathy, let's get started in the questions with you. It looks like you're in the middle of a lot of moving parts. Help us understand your role and how that connects to community members in need. Sure, thank you, John. There are lots of moving parts, um, and this is quite a community. It's quite a generous community, and it's a community that cares so much about the people that live here. Um, it's one of my favorite things about my job. Um, right now, uh, as you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and we are seeing a tremendous number of people, unprecedented, that are um, in need of services, food, um, shelter at some point, rent um, and utility assistance are the main needs that we are seeing right now in the community. So what we do is, is work with all of those partners in the community across the Tri-County to bring them together so that we can work collaboratively to serve people. Um, if we don't work together, um, we really can't serve people in a full way. 
So um, just incredible agencies um, in this community that want to do that. So right now, our big biggest role is we have a COVID-19 response fund that people have so generously um, donated to, and we are working to coordinate that with the agencies that are providing those services um, to provide them the funds to the clients that they see on a daily basis to help them um, remain as stable as they can during this time. We don't want people to be evicted. We don't want people to be without food. Um, and so we are working very, very diligently with them to provide services to those that are in need. Thanks, Kathy. And I'm guessing that the Berkeley and Dorchester centers are busier than ever. They are busier than ever. And we have learned lots of things during the pandemic. We have learned how to serve people virtually and, um, and get documents that are taken on people's cell phones. So, um, so it's, it's been quite a, um, initially a challenge, but it's really worked out to give us, teach us a lot. So those centers are very busy. For some people, it's very difficult for them to navigate the system. Um, it's a complicated system. We're working on that. It's not as complicated as it used to be, but help making sure people are going to the right place, um, have the documents they need, helping them understand that. So yes, um, very, very busy. Thanks, Kathy. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. George, your outreach has grown through the years with some level of stability. What impacts are you seeing in the wake of the pandemic uh, with your volunteers, your clients, and your staff? Well, it's affected everyone, John. Um, I guess it, first you'd have to kind of start with where, where, what is the normal for us back before this. And normally our office would be open five days a week. We'd have 12 to 15 volunteers coming in first thing in the morning, helping us pack out the meals, get the coolers ready and everything that goes with the meals. And then we have 21 routes that cover our service area. So we'd have drivers coming in after that, uh, taking those meals out each day. Uh, so when this happened about the third week in March, we kind of transitioned over to, at that point, we went to weekly deliveries. Uh, we no longer had the volunteers coming in, packing out the meals. The staff is doing that now. And the drivers come in weekly and, and we're freezing the meals now just for food safety reasons uh, and to accommodate this process. Uh, and we've moved everything outside, so it's kind of a drive-through process. They don't come in our building anymore. We're all in mass, socially distancing. So they drive up, they get their coolers, everything that they need to do the route, the sanitizers. Uh, and typically they would go out every day and spend time with their recipients and talk to them and that sort of thing. And now we're not doing the face-to-face. -face. Uh, so there's a cooler on their front porch or by their front door. They deliver the frozen meals to the cooler and actually take a sanitizer with them. Uh, to sanitize the cooler before they leave because we're serving really the most vulnerable population, you know, elderly, those with chronic health conditions. So just doing everything possible to minimize our exposure to each other, to the volunteers, and then especially to our recipients at this point. Thanks, George. Boy, that's, uh, those are basic and fundamental shifts um, in the way you deliver uh, the logistics and Oh my goodness, um, talk about pivoting, uh, both of you. Um, Kathy, what has the pandemic and, and the resulting shutdowns, what have they done to demand and your ability to address it? I mean, you still have systems in place and you've talked about some of the changes, but you interact with so many agencies. How has that worked? Well, we have a system that we use called Charity Tracker and we have about 320 agencies that use that system so that we can connect with each other. We can uh, real time see client information so we can, we can address needs without clients obviously going into an agency right now. So that's one of the pieces that has helped us a tremendous amount. The other is our 211 hotline. So that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can also access it online at sc211.org that has a listing of all of the agencies that are providing services right now. And so it's a great place, not only for agencies to see what's available for, for, um, for community members to go in and see what is available for them if they have the capacity to do that. Um, that, that line has been unbelievably busy. So 
just in, in uh, July, there was a 49% increase in requests for electric assistance. Um, it, it's just been a, a, just a, a, an unbelievable time for calls. Um, but it gives us the data to help us make good decisions about where funding should go because we know what people need. So um, they can provide that for us. Um, they had an increase in 73% of referrals that they provided in July. So it's, it's been terribly, terribly busy, but we're really glad that they're there and can, can provide that service. Um, and the other is funding. Um, there have been some government funding that's been available. And then we have, again, provided some funding for agencies to provide um, services to individuals. Um, it's critical that people have the food that they need. That's always the first thing in what we call a, any kind of an emergency, whether it will be in a hurricane um, or a pandemic. Um, food is almost always the first thing people need. So being able to provide that, it has been, and George knows this, um, it's the, the partners have done an incredible job of doing what George has done. So people drive up, open their trunk, say how many people are in the family, they put it in and then they drive off. And all of those agencies have stayed open. Um, when many businesses were closed, they were all open. George was delivering food, East Cooper, Community outreach was was providing food to people. So people are are continuing um, to provide those services. Um, and right now, the challenge is um, the eviction has been lifted. Utilities um, are starting uh, to be due, um, and we are seeing huge increase in the needs. I had. Um, Someone this week that needed a $1,300 utility bill paid and a family last month, last week that was going to be evicted um, that needed um, four months rent. So they owed a little over $4,000 and he had just started back to work. So the demands are much higher than what, what we are usually seeing. We usually see one month of an electric bill or one month rent and now that has just increased a tremendous amount. Wow, the, the depth and breadth of this is, is staggering. If you, if, you, if you sit still long enough to think through it all, it, it could get a little scary, I guess. Huh? It is. <laughs> and, and, and Kathy, uh, we have people who were already sort of on the edge, right? That yes. Before the pandemic, they were living and it was, uh, everything is kind of balanced right now, as long as nothing out of the ordinary. And, we are so far out of the ordinary um, that we've got people who are are unaccustomed to work, you know, even being in the system, let alone seeking services. So we have seen quite an increase in people who have, have never accessed services before. They've never had to. They've been the ones that donated. Um, they've been the ones that brought food to the to the food pantries, um, and now they are needing assistance. And that's really hard. Um, and our agencies do a great job of making people feel comfortable so they don't feel embarrassed or um, like they're doing something wrong by coming and trying to access those services. They want to take care of their families. Um, and it's not just needing um, monetary assistance, but we have uh, families that have children at home. So even if they're working remotely, they're still having to, to manage their, their kids and their schoolwork and their job and work. I mean, it's, it's just the stress of all of that has been incredible. That's one of the increases we've seen on the 211 um, hotline is people calling that need mental health um, counseling because they are so, so, so stressed. So it, it's, and there's not a one size fits all or one solution that fits all. Um, and so you just have to um, be with that person, be, in, be present with that person and look at their individual situation and see how we can help them the best that we can. Wow, that is, uh, that is boots on the ground work, work right there, Kathy. Um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, George, um, I think we, we have a basic understanding of, of what East Cooper Meals on Wheels does, right? It, it gets meals to people who are often homebound or otherwise incapable of preparing their own meals. 
Um, but if you would, talk a little bit about what sets Eats Cooper Meals on Wheels apart from other Meals on Wheels organizations around the state and around the country. Yeah, I think, John, there's a, a lot of different ways. You know, over the past years, uh, we've had many firsts at our organization. We were the first in the state to offer a second meal. We were first with a breakfast program, uh, one of the few that's doing a fresh fruit program. Uh, we also do nutritional drinks uh, like Ensure and Glucerna. Uh, we deliver pet food. If someone's homebound and can't get their own meals, and if they have a dog or a cat who's probably their best friend in the world, uh, we deliver food for them as well. Uh, during the summer, even right now, we're delivering flowers that get donated to us each each week uh, just to kind of brighten their day. And like Kathy said, we're hearing so much more about the psychological aspects. And I think everyone in the general public has more empathy now for the people that we serve because they everyone's kind of found out a little bit what it's like to be homebound. Uh, so, and even for our recipients, it's been a new challenging time for them without us being able to come in and spend time with them or neighbors or anything like that. So we've actually, you know, we've actually lost some of our, I don't want to say regular customers, but, you know, I've talked to a couple of the recipients that said, I can't take it anymore. You know, my son's coming from Greenville to pick me up and they're going to stay with family and things like that. But then we're seeing new clients, you know, the 40 year old grocery store worker who's been diagnosed with positive with COVID. So we're feeding her for two weeks while she's out of work. Uh, and helping to take care of her till she can go back in uh, and do that. So it's it's been a big change. Uh, you know, like you said, a, a lot of different firsts for us. I think one of the aspects, like I said, is the psychological, and that's where our volunteers uh, they, they're so big hearted. Uh, that's they always say that they get more out of it than the recipients do. And even during this, even though we're only delivering, and we've actually switched in May to going to twice a week now instead of once a week. But our recipients, uh, we provided them with their list from their routes and they're calling their recipients on a daily basis just to check on them, just to talk to them, to see how they're doing. Because uh, like you said, it's it, it, confined at home and your view of the world is uh, not to be critical of the news right now, but it's, it's, it's not a cheerful picture uh, watching the news right now. So it's good to have that voice. Uh, we sent out uh, on Monday, yesterday, we sent out what we called love notes. So it was just a little note from the staff to everyone. They had a little hand colored heart on it and everything just to hopefully cheer their day up a little bit and the fresh flowers going out to them and that sort of thing. Let them know that we're, even though we're not there face to face with them, everybody's still thinking about them and sending a lot of love their way. Loving them from a distance as it were. Yeah. Yeah. George, um, I, I also have wondered a little bit about, um, and this is a wonderful sort of a fact, but um, East Cooper Meals on Wheels is able to deliver meals without having to pay someone to do that traditionally. Right. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I tell you, it's, you know, everything this year has been so upside down. There's for every plus, you know, for every minus, there's been a plus. You know, our largest fundraiser of the year is the gala, and it was supposed to be the first of April, and it's been canceled until next year. Uh, but then, like Kathy said, other funding opportunities have come up that have kind of covered that. So we've always had since day one, I believe, uh, there would never be a wait list and there'd never be a charge for meals. Uh, so some people have kind of questioned that over the years because we do, we serve, uh, we're not a poverty-based program. So we serve anyone who's homebound and can't prepare a meal. Uh, but I actually ran the numbers uh, a while back on that. And about 70% of our recipients are in poverty. But for those that are not in poverty, about 80% of those people had made some form of a financial donation uh, to our organization. Uh, and we're very kind of blessed right now. I, you know, when I see organizations downtown and, you know, the hotels and the restaurants and how they've been so impacted, uh, I feel very fortunate that we can still operate, still provide those meals to everyone. Uh, and just feel so blessed to be what, doing what we're doing right now. Thanks, George. Um, boy, oh boy, that's, uh, that is just, and then forgive me for gushing a little bit, but the work that you're doing is so essential to the welfare of our community. Um, you know, these are people, human beings that we would oftentimes just see and say hello, whether it's in church or in the grocery store or what have you. And, and now their lives have been shaken uh, almost beyond recognition in some ways. 
Um, yeah, and like Kathy said, we're seeing other requests may have, you know, for utilities and different things like that that have happened during this. Uh, yard work, we've had, you know, the police department partnered with us and they've been out going, taking care of the yards during all of this because we are in the summer season and everything's growing. Uh, so the community has just really stepped up from all directions and I really, I call it neighbors taking care of neighbors. Uh, and it's just a, a, a great thing to be a part of it. Yes, indeed. Thanks, George. Um, Rebecca, let's, uh, let's pull you in here for a second. Um, you're always listening with, uh, with both ears and uh, you might have a question or two or have one from somebody that's attending live. I do. So this is for both George and Kathy. Kathy, I'll start with you since George okay. just had a time to talk. Um, same question. Uh, once you, once we all get through this pandemic, we've all done pivots to get through mm -hmm. it. Operationally speaking or organizationally speaking, what, as you pivoted, what would you keep from that pivot moving forward for the long term? And what are you um, looking forward to no longer doing and bringing back the old way? Um, we've learned a lot, Rebecca. Um, we've learned a lot about um, different ways to serve people. You know, we all know transportation can be a huge issue in this community. And, um, and we really have learned that we can serve people virtually. I don't think we could do everyone virtually, but um, but we've learned different ways to get documents and things that we would need. Um, it's made us very aware that everybody doesn't have a computer. Everybody doesn't have a printer. And so there have been some programs out there that are fabulous programs. You can go online to apply for assistance, um, but you've got to print a form that has to be filled out. And do you know what an affidavit is? And do you know what a W-9 is that you have to take to your landlord? So it's, it has raised our awareness that we cannot assume that everybody has the equipment to do all of those things and everybody understands what is available. Um, we've also learned that um, the, we never, I don't know how we could have even planned for the numbers of people that would need assistance. And so what might have taken three days to process with the number of people, sometimes it's taking three weeks. Um, and so if someone's getting ready to have their lights cut off, you can't wait three weeks to process that. So we've, we've learned some ways that, um, things that we need to do to help, help speed that up, but, um, but that's taken some working through because many grants have guidelines that that are out of all of our control that we have to provide certain information for people. And so how can we do that? But, but how can we really serve folks better? And um, they need someone to talk to. And so it isn't just talking to them on the phone about what their present need is, but just how they're doing. They just, they just want to talk to somebody. Um, so there are a lot of things that we've learned. Um, we've learned we can be paperless with the work that we do um, in Charity Tracker. So we really have learned some good lessons that I think will change how we provide services. Um, and some things that if we ever were in this situation again, things that we could do better. It's inter interesting, Kathy, you bring up the recognition that not everybody has access to the internet we certainly learned that it's been in the media with school children. I really hadn't thought about it until you mentioned mm -hmm. it, that it really goes beyond that. So it is. Yeah. And they go to the libraries or they go to an agency that allows them to use a, a computer bank. But those places are not open right now. Very true. So Very true. It, it, it's just been a real awareness of things that we need to plan for and look to in the future if we should ever need them again. Hopefully not. George, um, same question for you with your pivot. What do you expect you'll keep for the long term? But what are you looking forward to going back uh, to the old way of doing, so to speak? And yeah, we've actually been looking at a lot of things. And as we were brainstorming at the office, we came up with the idea, why don't we ask the people we serve? So we did a mm -hmm. formal assessment and sent that out about three and a half, four weeks ago. And it was interesting, the things we learn, um, you know, we've always had a preference for fresh. I think there's some convenience things with frozen that our recipients like. Uh, we learned pretty quickly that storage was an issue 
we thought, well, everyone has a freezer. But then I, I should have known a lot of people are like my grandparents. Uh, the freezer is full already. They don't know what it is, but they're not going to throw it away. Uh, so those were some of the issues that we saw with that. Uh, it kind of reinforced some things that we were already doing. We started an initiative about four years, five years ago, changing our menu under the kind of the tagline of food is medicine, uh, greatly improving the nutrition mm. and showing those impacts on chronic health conditions. So this has all kind of been reinforced with us because we've seen people with chronic health conditions, how the COVID virus impacted them versus those that were otherwise healthy. So it's just kind of reinforced what we were doing there, uh, kind of reevaluating again, trying to roll that out for more of our meals. Uh, we also heard big loudly from our recipients, the fresh fruit program. We did have to close that for about two months and we restarted it. Uh, so that was one of the things that they really missed was the fresh fruit. And then just basically what we already know, the face-to-face -face contact every day. Uh, we always say more than a meal, uh, that face-to-face -face visit, the relationships that develop are as important, if not more important, we're learning than the meals that we're taking out. Uh, so we definitely wanna get back to that as soon as we can. But again, knowing that it's a very, very vulnerable population that we serve. I don't even have a date when we can get back to the old normal uh, of doing things that way daily in the face-to-face -face contact. So it's been interesting. It kind of makes you take a look at everything from top to bottom and how you've been doing it and rethinking mm -hmm. it, and asking those questions and getting feedback. So uh, a lot we'll keep and uh, probably a few things that will change going forward. Thanks, George. And Rebecca, thank you. Great question. Um, and that boy, there's a great question for any organization really, right? Mm -hmm. Is how we've had to flex and pivot and what are those things we will keep? I, I'm pretty sure Zoom is here to stay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> saves a lot on travel time and the commute, right? Um, uh, Kathy, if you would, uh, how about a final thought on what we've been discussing today and where someone can reach you or contact you? Sure, I think, I think my final thought, um, John, would be thank you and thank you to the community. I, it just always, as long as I have been doing this work, I, I'm, I'm, ne I'm just always amazed at how uh, giving and loving and caring this community is and how people step up when we need to, even in a difficult time as this. Um, it, it just, we, we raised for this fund that we've been doing for COVID um, more than we ever had in any other um, emergency or disaster that we have, have helped with in the past. Um, and, and people really are excited to be able to help. They're so grateful that they may still be working. And so, um, so that has just been incredible. And um, I'm and, and happy to point people in the right direction if they're interested in being a part of that. Um, but just really just thank you. Um, you can reach me here at Try to United Way at 740-7733 um, um, or C Easley, E-A-S-L-E-Y -E -E at TUW.org. Um, and even if you just have some questions, I'm more than happy to talk to people about what's going on in the community um, and, and point them in the right direction if they, if they need a place to go. Wonderful. Kathy, thank you so much for being with us, thank George. Thank you. Uh, how about a final thought and where someone can reach you? Yeah, I think likewise, a big thank you. The community has been so supportive. Uh, we're always trying to get the message out there. A lot of people think of Meals on Wheels and think we only serve elderly people in poverty and that's not the case. So we're putting that plug out there. We have capacity. If there's anyone out there that either you yourself or you know someone has been diagnosed with this virus, please give us a call. Uh, it's 881-9350, or you can go to our website, ecmow.org, and you can sign up for meals 24 hours a day. Uh, but we just want people to know that we're a resource. We're here available. Uh, it's not just for the elderly. Some people think, well, Meals on Wheels, the food might not be that good, but you'd be surprised. It's uh, <laughs> We've gotten rave reviews from people that have come on new, like that uh, uh, that uh, grocery store worker, she was amazed with how good the food was and everything and gave us glowing marks on that. So uh, just thank you to the community and we're here to serve and uh, please let us know if there's anyone out there that we can serve. George, thank you. So thank you, Kathy Easley, Director of Integrated Community Systems for Trident United Way. 
and George Roberts, President and CEO of East Cooper Meals on Wheels. Thanks to all of our chamber members with us live and those catching us on the recording. And a big thank you to the Mount Pleasant Chamber's own Rebecca Imholtz for keeping us on track today. From all of us at the Mount Pleasant Chamber, thank you for joining us this week for The Pivot. Make it a great week. Thank you. Thank you.